So I said when I was about 13, I, I wrote an essay on, on Auschwitz, and I, I was trying to understand it. Um, I think maybe I tried to understand it in a way that was somewhat different than most people who examine historical events, because I was trying to understand how human beings could do that, knowing full well that I was one of them. One of the things that the Auschwitz guards used to do to the prisoners, and this is very telling, so at Auschwitz there was a sign that said, work will make you free. It was a little joke. Not really a very funny joke. You know, it's the kind of joke that you have to be... Satanic is the appropriate term to conceptualize and to dare to, to, to state. So when the Auschwitz prisoners came to Auschwitz, you know, they were already pretty, pretty rough shape. They were in cattle cars. They had been separated from their families. Everything had been taken from them. They were transported for a long time. They were standing up. The kids were suffocating because there was no room in the, you know, it was so packed in there. They didn't have anything to eat. There weren't any toilet facilities of any sort. It was like you got rid of 20% of the people just transporting them. You know, the ones on the outside of the cars, they froze to death because, of course, it was cold and pretty nasty. And then when they got to Auschwitz, what, the guards used to have this game that they would play. And this is part of the work will set you free thing. They would get a prisoner, they'd take a prisoner who's already in pretty, you know, pretty rough shape. And then have them carry a sack of wet salt, 100 pounds, from one side of the camp to the other. And, you know, when you think of a camp, you think of something like a football field, you know, maybe something that big, fences around. It's like, no way, man, these were cities. These were, there were tens of thousands of people in these places. So from one side of the camp compound to the other, that was a good hike. And that wasn't bad enough. They had to get them to carry it back and put it in the same place. Now. That's poetic in its malevolence. You know, what you're doing is you're harnessing the human compulsion to engage in useful activity and demonstrating how absolutely futile that is despite its difficulty. Seems like a bad thing to do. People need... It's a parody of meaninglessness. That's what that is. And, you know, people need meaning in their lives because their lives are difficult. And so, the question is, to what end should you devote your life? And then the question is, well, is there something you should be aiming at? It's a good question. That's the question of the meaning of life. And you know, one of the things that's supposed to happen when you come to university is that that's the sort of question that should be addressed. And as far as I can tell, and this might just be my more cynical side, what I see happening to university students, generally speaking, is that they come in clinging to the wreckage of their culture and floating with the pieces, and those pieces are taken away by professors who tell them that everything can be dis deconstructed and no, nothing has any real meaning, and it's like, when you're finally educated, it's when you're floating out on the ocean and you've got nothing to stay afloat with. It's like, well, then you're, you're done and you can graduate.
I don't see that as useful. Quite the contrary. You dismantle it in consultation with its occupant, attempting to build something more beautiful and functional on the, on the foundation. It's not a safe space. You know, in, in my classes, and I tell my students this right at the beginning, I'm trying to get them to understand why they are Nazis. Right, there isn't anything more unsafe than that. And all of them, virtually all of them, write back to me afterwards and say, uh, this was the most worthwhile class I've ever had in my life, and it changed my life. It's like, well, I'm teaching you the worst possible thing about yourself. And your response is, oh, that was so useful, and I'm way better than I was. You know, it's, it's, but it's in keeping with the idea that you need to be exposed to things that you fear and hate, because that's where salvation lies, roughly speaking. Evil is more pernicious than that which is generated, for example, by social inequality. I think it's actually, although this is a terrifying thought in some ways, it's more appropriate to consider it a form of uh, demonically warped aesthetic. I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that, for example, because the exa because the manifestation of this warped aesthetic, aesthetic makes itself apparent under certain conditions. So, for example, I think it made itself apparent in the imagination of the first politician who, con who coined the acronym uh, MAD, or Mutual Assured Dis Destruction. That's an aesthetic of evil, to, to make a joke of a, a situation that catastrophic indicates the kind of malevolence that lurks behind the fact that such a condition exists. The motto on the gates of Auschwitz, I believe, work will make you free. That's another manifestation of the aesthetic of evil. It's a terrible, terrible, ironic joke. And it, it, it's instructive to meditate on what sort of imagination would have the arrogance to tell such a terrible joke. The concentration camps are classic examples of evil. I think by an analyzing at least certain kinds of events that occurred within them, it's easier to get a clear idea of what evil constitutes. And one, one of the stories that's always haunted me, I guess, is I believe it's another story derived from Auschwitz. The prison guards in Auschwitz would take the prisoners who were already stripped of their dignity and to whatever degree possible their identity and their culture and their language and their status of, as valuable beings and yet that wasn't sufficient. They needed to be tortured in addition to that before they were killed and the torture often consisted of uh, self-evidently counterproductive work, uh, uh, a situation that also frequently characterized activity in the Soviet Gulag Archipelago where Perhaps 60 million people met their death. A typical Auschwitz example was the requirement for prisoners to carry 100 pound sacks of wet salt from one side of the compound and then back again. Now that's evil as far as I'm concerned and, and you have to think about it from an aesthetic perspective in a sense because it's a celebration of horror. And it, it, it's, a, it's a conscious attempt to violate the, the conditions that make life itself tolerable. And it's aimed at dehumanization, destruction of the ideal, and at an even deeper level, revenge against the conditions of existence itself. I've tried to understand the developmental pathway that leads to acts like that. The police pr prosecuting people for 
you know, asking people to turn in their neighbors if they say something offensive. And that's happening in, in the UK. Yeah, literally, well, we saw that, that, you know, somebody sent me posters, pictures of posters in the, in the Scottish subway, in the, in the metro, in the tube, you know, saying, inviting people to inform on their neighbors for being offensive. It's like, what, what the hell? So I knew this was coming because, because I knew we brought our first hate speech laws in, in Canada back in the 1980s. We were after this character named Ernst Zundel, who is a per particularly despicable piece of work, hard hat wearing, right wing, anti-Semite, Holocaust denier. You know, he had it all, that guy. You know, it was his shenanigans, careless, malevolent shenanigans that enticed Canadians into producing hate speech legislation. I thought, no, that's, that's not good. It's not good. You're making a big mistake. We're going to pay for this. It's going to unfold over a long time. Who defines hate? The crucial issue. It's not like it's a scientific category. It's a judgment. And the answer is those whom you least want to have the power to define it. Because they're the ones that will take that power to themselves. And if you think that isn't going to affect what you get to say, well, you've got another think coming. So I think it's, I think it's, we're going to pay for it. And hopefully, hopefully we'll wake up and push back before we have to pay too high a price. You can spot Zundel stickers around Munich. Germans awake, they say. Join the battle. Ernst Zundel, a fighter for Germany. Adolf Hitler was not the demon that the modern propaganda made him out to be. He was a very decent man and a very peaceful man. We're going to pay for it. So, yeah. And we're going to deserve to pay for it, too. He's talking to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Well, you know, last night, last night I was on this British show called uh, Question Time, which is a very famous British show, and there was a, um, a woman parliamentarian there from Ireland who, who was pretty bright. I liked listening to her. But um, the, the host asked me about this character named Count Dankula. I don't know if you know about him. Um, his girlfriend, he's a comedian. Well, he thinks he's a comedian. And, well, but, you know, there are lots of comedians who think they're comedians that aren't funny. And, and I'm not saying he's not funny, because other people think that he's a comedian too, but he presents himself as a comedian. Count Dankula. I mean, that's actually a joke, that name. Um, and his girlfriend had a pug, and I liked Count Dankula because he hated that pug. And I'm not very fond of pugs. I think they're hideous little creatures. It's just sort of like the, the, this little rat-like dog with these bug, bug... You know, if you hit a pug on the back of the head, the eyes will pop out. And so, because they've been so genetically mishandled, and so Dankula didn't like his girlfriend's pug, and 
so he thought he'd play a mean trick and, or a mean slash funny trick and teach it to do a Hail Hitler salute, which I actually thought was quite funny. It's like, I don't, look, I don't see that as glorifying Hitler. It's a pug, for God's sake. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, what do you call those, Doberman. You know, it was a pug. It's like teaching a rat to do a Hail Hitler salute. I love how and, this has come down to the breed of dog with you. Well, these things matter in terms of, their, of the way they're represented, you know. And then, you know, he, he taught it to, <laughs> it's so horrible. He, and I'm going to be so killed for this. Um, he, he taught it to do its little salute when he said, gas the Jews, which is not funny, you know, except it's horribly funny, you know, that's the thing. Well, look, and so, yeah, you laugh, that's right, because you're all horrible, and you know, and you know perfectly well that it's horribly funny. And, and you know, we need, we need to be able to be horribly funny. Because life is horrible, and we, and we need to be able to find... <laughs> we need to be able to allow people the freedom to find the ability to transcend that horror with comedy. And, and a mark of a free society is that com comedians can be just exactly what they are, is which they're people who push the edge of what's acceptable. If you're a brilliant comedian, you get right to the edge, right, and you dance there. And the audience is thinking, oh, Sarah Silverman's a good example of that, you know, because you can just see her, she's got all politically correct recently, but when she was in her heyday, you could just see Sarah, she's so smart. You'd see her sitting there, and she'd think of something just spectacularly evil and horrible. And she'd think, oh, and then she'd say it, you know, and everyone would just crack up because, like, the darkest part of their soul had once thought something like that, and she dared to utter it. And by uttering it, she also simultaneously transcended it, you know, and that's the beauty of comedy. And, 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 well, so anyways, they, they went after Dankula and, and nailed him legally. And I thought, that, and that's in Great Britain as well. And last night, so th they brought this up on, on Question Time. And, you know, the, the Irish woman um, who said she went off on a, a talk about how terrible Kristallnacht was and what an awful thing Auschwitz and, and the Holocaust was. It's like, well... It's, you're not that morally virtuous to notice that. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and it didn't have anything to do with the topic at hand. It's like, yeah, you wouldn't say that you noticed that unless you were implying that were peop there were people around you, including this Count Dankula, who didn't notice that. Okay, it had nothing to do with whether he should have been prosecuted for his stupid joke. And, it, and then you can say, well, you could say it was a stupid joke, which it certainly was. You could say that it was a hateful joke, which I don't agree with, by the way. But you could say that, and I think you could you can make a credible case for that. But then to say that because you think that the Holocaust was bad, he should be criminally prosecuted. It's like, no, sorry, man, you've crossed the line, and, and there's no excuse for it. And so that's part of what's worrisome about the state of discourse in in the free west. That same thing, comedians won't go to university campuses. It's the same thing, you don't get to be funny. Zundel became an international hero to the Nazi movement when he was put on trial in Canada for publishing a pamphlet which denied Hitler's slaughter of six million Jews. Zundel turned the affair into a media circus. At the Nuremberg rallies, they had all sorts of people there. They had like the shovel brigade, and they were all standing there with their shovels, ready to you know, shovel for Germany. And, and athletes and all sorts of people 
a raid so that, you know, there, there's this massive display of order and power. And so you look at the top left-hand corner, you see all those people are lined up. It's absolutely perfect. And then you see the same thing on the right here. Right? Look, you look at the organization of that. Everything's square and perfect and everybody's in line and, you know, they're all in uniforms and they're all going like this the same way. And then when they, when they march, the soldiers, they're in perfect lines in perfect squares and they're all going like this, you know. It's, it's absolutely rigid, orderly perfection. Will you move to Oslo and run for Prime Minister of Norway? 